Hey everybody, welcome to another uh, Research Hub community call. And to get things kicked off today, um, we're thinking about building a couple of new features here over the next quarter. And one thing that we want to focus on is improving our current uh, post-publication peer review feature. There's a couple of uh, different things uh, that we think we can do here. But uh, one topic I wanted to specifically focus on today is like the utility of anonymity in peer review. And so I think we should just kind of like go over everyone's thoughts here, whether like <laughs> you should by default be anonymous, should there be an option between uh, like leaving your name to a review or leaving an anonymous review? Should there be a penalty if you don't use your name attached to a review? Or should or should we require essentially everyone to have to have their identity tied to different peer reviews? There's like uh, obviously pros and cons to each of these. Um, just for a little bit of context, PubPeer is like my favorite project in the space that I think is doing uh, post-publication peer reviews really well. And they give everyone the option of staying anonymous. And even their founder uh, was like an anon dev building like a, a science product for five years before he even was willing to tie his identity to like a, a peer review publication platform. Um, so yeah, I think there's like a lot of different things to consider and would love to hear what everybody thinks. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I think I like the idea of having the option. Um, I think at least for pre-publication peer reviews, that's how it is right now, where, you know, it's like like some of the dermatology journals like JAD and stuff, they're like, you can click at the end uh, where A, for if you want to be known for the review, um, and then B, even if the journal doesn't accept it, and if they send the review somewhere else, do you want your name even there or not? So um, I'm not like in either way in favor or against of if you want to penalize somebody for not you know revealing the identity or not but um giving the option is at least at the very least um is a good idea cool Kobe. yeah i just had a question because i'm not sure how these things uh typically work in real life uh but um who sets the anonymity level like i know that some journals have like a single blind double blind should that be the choice of the author or should that be something that we enforce? Maybe someone can shed some light on that. Does, does anyone have, you can just jump in to answer uh, Kobe's question if anybody has insight. Well, I feel like I don't have insight because I don't know what the pros and cons of either one or optional are. Well, kind of think through that. I guess to answer um, one of the questions, and maybe other people who have submitted to journals can corroborate this, but like anytime, like my papers have been peer reviewed, like they've signed their name to sign their name to it, and like I, as the person who published, like if somebody writes me a review, whether it's good or bad, and they don't sign their name to it, and I don't even know what their credentials are, like. I don't know how to feel about it. Like somebody who has no idea what they're doing writes me a good review. How do I feel about it? Somebody who has no idea what they're doing writes me a bad review. How do I feel about it? I, I guess as the person being reviewed, I don't know how to feel about a review who I have no idea who it came from. So yeah, like Lynn said, currently it's like pretty much single blinded. So essentially like you submit and they know exactly who you are as the submitter of the, the publication. Uh, and then there is generally three reviewers that are like kind of vetted by like the publishing group. Uh, and so essentially as like the submitter, you're trusting that the publishing group has chosen three <laughs> reviewers that are um, experts in the field and are going to be unbiased in the way that they assess your paper. Uh, so like in this situation, um, it's like you're placing trust in the publishing group to choose those people but because we're doing peer review out in the kind of the open and anybody can jump in those people are not really vetted so i you know i think that's one drawback of anonymity is um like unless we have like a really really solid reputation system already in place it'll be hard for i think someone that wants to remain anonymous to like be seen as credible to be to review your paper um and so maybe it could be like something like on a temporal like time span where 
maybe early on we tell everyone, hey, you need to kind of tell us who you are. But once we have enough people and the reputation system is good, then we can give the anonymous option. Yeah. One thing. Why do we want anonymity? I don't understand what the value is for something because like peer review. People won't criticize like superiors in their field. Like it's there's like professional risk associated with providing not good peer reviews, even good peer reviews, and you sometimes can get more intellectual honesty uh, if the like uh, person's identity is hidden. But at the same time, like uh, there's a lot of potential for abuse as well. And I think one of the big differences between like the standard peer review system and what we're discussing here is like uh, someone knows who you are. Like if you do a peer review for a journal, the editor knows who you are. So maybe the author doesn't, but you're not like anonymous. Like if you said something really mean or inappropriate, like there would be professional consequences to it. Um, and here, like in theory, anonymity can entail like basically a Reddit username, like pseudonymity where you can not really have any real life consequences for saying something that may not be, you know, within like a positive spirit of like productive criticism. Well, wouldn't the account yeah. potentially be subject to like, even if it's anonymous on the back end, the account would still be subject to some sort of um, disciplinary action, right? So I don't understand. Where... Yeah, so, so that is an option. Like we could have anonymity where like people can tag a review for being inappropriate or something like that. And then there can be like consequences that like come back to that person. Um, yeah, the design space is big. We can do a bunch of different things. I mean, I think the clear thing is just to make it optional and then to like deal with the consequences of it to like the best extent that we can, right? One, one thing I want to add is in the current system, there's also an option some journals provide for the authors where if there are clear conflicts, they can say we request that these people not be on the reviewer list. Um, you know, if they are like a competing lab or if they are, um, you know, vying for the same grant or something. Mm -hmm. um, so that, 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 that criteria is available for even the authors. And uh, going back to the anonymity part, uh, in addition to what uh, Patrick mentioned, I think a few meetings ago, we had discussed that if you wanted this platform to be like, you know, decide and open to everybody, um, then the credentials um, uh, would should not come in the way of if if somebody is doing a legit criticism of some paper, um, you know, and or the other way would be that we start vetting for who can do the review or not, right? Then then we have to do that, uh, but at least an option of it um, is is a must because there could be like a chairman of some big department whose paper is getting criticized and. There's a resident or a postdoc who's trying to criticize it here on research of and get in real trouble real quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the way it is, it kind of feels like there is no downside to have an optional anonymity, right? Because if you really think about it, there is no identity verification process right now. So anyone could just create an account under any name. So if we don't have strict identity tie into our account, then why enforce it, right? And if you think about it, if, if a person decided to post a review anonymously, if you don't have an anonymous option, they will just not participate, right? So you're reducing the number of users who will use the feature. Plus, um, I mean, at, at least at present, we have editors who can, who are already checking for comments that are not like, you know, not appropriate and, you know, removing those or, or flagging those. So the same can be done for peer reviews. I think maybe the, the, the sweet spot here uh, could be in having a sort of like a backend where, you know, kind of like research app can verify what are your credentials and you are basically, you know, free to choose if you want to be anonymous or not so that you can basically be held accountable for what do you say, what do you, what do you, what do you publish uh, in India? Yeah, that's, that's how journals essentially do it. Like the reviewer can sign their name when they send you your review. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But the journal like always knows, you know, that it's a person in the field who knows what they're doing. So that would be the typical like 
journal method. Okay, because uh, I never saw any name associated to my reviews, so I didn't. Have on the last on the last paper that I got accepted to cognition, um, like the one of the reviewers, the, the first reviewer signed his name, and I actually was able to contact him and like work through like some of the issues he had with it, like. So yeah, like people do. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I think, as you said, there's there's no downside to it. I think, and this is also a way that you know, in, in a way, in, th in this way, we don't have to vet anyone. Like we we can just like you know have have our database or who's making the comments and the reviews and letting anyone participate, even if even if they don't have you know any credential, but their criticism is you know constructive. You know why not? Why not having you know the platform? And that can be obviously you know tied to the reputation. So there's a lot of things that we can do there uh, associating with the reputation of a user. Yep. Oh, uh, Ricardo kind of like uh, hit the the nail on the head with what I was gonna say. I guess just like the one like main concern is with like the anonymity part. And obviously, I'm I'm all kind of generally for anonymity in terms of like. Um, kind of like DeFi and some other things, but um, like uh, like the 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 concept of like potential like kind of collusion and like nepotism, like you know, your I mean, it happens in the current system where like your friends an editor or a reviewer, and you submit a paper, and like they kind of push you along and like you know treat you extra nicely and stuff like that. And so when an editor or peer reviewer is anonymous, you know, maybe their friend submits a paper and you know, maybe they'd usually give someone a seven out of 10 on that paper, but it's their friend. You don't know that because they're anonymous. They're just talking behind the scenes and maybe they give their friend a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. And I guess in theory that works itself out when you have enough people peer reviewing where like the their, their nine out of 10 gets dampened by other editors uh, giving it a seven out of 10. And so it regulates itself. Um, but again, that's like once we reach scale. Um, so I guess that's just like kind of one drawback to think about with the anonymity. Yeah, one, one thing I think about is like, um, like, why would I not want to have my name tied to a peer review? And like the, the things that pop up most are like there's professional consequences. And so I, I almost think like, um, what, what if there's a cost to like posting anonymously? where like maybe you earn less tokens because you don't have your name tied to it, or maybe it costs you like 10 RSC in order to post something anonymously, uh, or maybe you have to stake coins. Like it, it, I like the idea of like, if you post anonymously, you're doing it because science needs you to, rather than you're doing it because you wanna earn money from it. Um, I'm not sure if like that is a, a reasonable perspective, but like- Well, well how would you be, earning money from posting anonymously though um coins so research coin so if you post a peer review that's highly upvoted like you can earn research coin or like get supported for sharing that content and we could say something where like if you do it anonymously like maybe you don't earn any research coin for it or like you earn 50 percent of the normal rewards like some kind of disincentive where i think we'd be better off if like the majority of the time people have their names attached but like there's certain circumstances that, you know, it's more important to have a correct scientific record. So I almost think there should be cost to it, but not 100% sure about that. And well, and what if, can the anonymity just be, to, like, does, it doesn't have to be to the person who's getting reviewed. It could be to just us, you know, someone at Research Hub as well, you know, like I, I still think that that would be considered putting your name on it if we can verify, you know what I mean? If at least somebody can verify it. Yeah, it's likely that behind the scenes, we would know who it was like in our database. Um, we'd have to build some security measures to make sure that that information is very protected, but it would really only be available to people who have access to the database. So not like the average user, the average editor or anything like that. Right. Anton? I'll... Go ahead, Edwin, you go first. I like the idea of 50%, by the way, just putting that out there. Does anybody else have any thoughts there before we move on, like about having a cost associated to being anonymous? I yeah, think it's I think reasonable. It, reasonable. It could, it could be. I mean, I think we are only focused on one frame here that anonymity is on, on only exists to protect uh, the users from the 
you know, potential consequences of their job life, but we also can view anonymity as just a quality of life feature, right? That, that makes me think about YouTubers, right? Some YouTubers choose to reveal their face and identity, and some YouTubers never reveal their face and they, and they still produce quality content, right? And some people might be more comfortable producing reviews and, you know, knowing that they can avoid the associated drama. Right, so they can share their opinion. It could be a, a, a qualified and accurate opinion. They're just not open to potentially provocative interactions with the user base, right? Yeah, but this seems a lot more consequential than producing content on YouTube, though. Agreed. Yeah, that, and that's why we potentially should consider it even more seriously, right? So if, if we want this to be a somewhat relaxed experience for people, right? And maybe relaxed in a way that it brings them joy, it doesn't bring them stress in their life, then maybe uh, anonymity is even more important than for YouTube channel. Well, I think uh, if you're just post like commenting on a paper, that's one thing, but when you're talking about peer review, I think you have to be held to a high standard there. I, and, I have to agree. But I just don't, I don't see, especially because again, we're talking about from the point of view of the poster, but as the point of view of readers, like, what do we make of a review that we have no idea who it came from? Like, yeah. I just don't, you know, I would not be interested if nobody vetted this person, I'm not going to be interested in the review. That's just me personally, but I have no idea where it came from. That's like reading an article without a source. Yeah. But if it's disincentivized, it, al it almost makes it more intriguing. That the person it does, but that. I don't know. But I feel like tough. at the very least, you would, if, if you previously would not have considered that peer review, the disincentive, like doing it in spite of the disincentive, would mean at the very least you should consider what it has to say, even if you yeah. don't have credence as you agreed. Say. Uh, Kobe. Yeah, I definitely see the merits of having someone's name associated with uh, a review because th that corroborates who reviewed it. And I think that matters quite a bit. I'm thinking if we go with the anonymity aspect, one way in which it could work is if we also reveal the person's reputation. So if you don't, like we want to uh, assess credibility, right? So at least you can see the person's name, but maybe you can see the reputation, and that can go a long way. Just a thought here. Well, Probably course, best to put the percentile of the reputation yeah. more than the actual reputation. And yeah, because then they couldn't cross-reference it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So you don't, you can't cross-reference and be like, oh, very specific. Yeah. Good point. Once we eventually get to like hub-specific reputation too, if it's like in the psychology hub, yeah. if you see a peer review that says, you know, anonymous user. In the top ten percent of the psychology hub, or something like that. Like that's yeah, fun. that would help a lot. Uh, Sapik. Yeah, uh, my point was: could we possibly have a threshold uh, before which people aren't allowed to post anonymously? So totally. we could have a uh, like not specifically reputation because you can raise your reputation by uh, posting a lot of papers and making a lot of simple comments. Uh, but what if you uh, what if what if there was a peer review specific threshold uh, that you could only reach by uh, by posting a totally transparent peer review, and once you clear that threshold, that uh, so the community would know that you are uh, credible enough, and then you are allowed to post uh, anonymously. Could that be uh, one way of going with it? Yeah, we could do it by rep like that. We could also do it by like you have to stake a certain amount of RSC and we can make the amount something where like you've had to have been around for a while in order to earn that RSC to gain the privilege of posting anonymously. Um, there, there's like lots of different ways that we could do it. But I like that idea. Uh, Malik? Yeah, um, coming back to that, like a little bit along the lines of what Satwik said, but we can also do it just as traditional method, like right now, in order to be a peer reviewer, you have to go through a process through the journal. Everybody has a different format, like, um, you know, that like JAD is where you have to work with another peer reviewer for a year before you can do it. Um, other journals are more relaxed where you must have done this many number of publications before we let you in. So then we can have the credentials checked on the back end and 
say, okay, you are good for a peer reviewer. You can do this anonymously or something like that. Um, you know, but um, I mean, again, I don't want to beat the same thing, but I still, I still feel it strongly that anonymity should be an option um, to the reviewer so that they don't get harmed in any way or form um, for saying something about a paper that's written by some big shot, you know? So, so, so I guess to like explicitly confirm this, does anyone here feel like anonymity is a bad thing? Like if we, like people should always have their names attached to it. Does anybody hold that perspective? Okay, nice. Like it seems like we unanimously feel like there should be an option for anonymity. And then the question is like, is that available to everyone or only certain users? And how do you unlock it if it's only available to certain users? Um, What's the benefit of making it available to everyone versus certain users? Because it seems to me like if we're talking about something like you don't want to criticize the head of some, you know, department that you're a part of. And let's say you're, you know, a first year PhD student or even like a, a senior in college and you join Research Hub late. You haven't, <clears throat> you know, developed your profile. But you have genuine insight. I don't see why we want to disincentivize that. I think it makes more sense to say you don't earn as much because you you are anonymous than saying only people who've reached this threshold get to be anonymous. That's my perspective. I think the benefit would just be more utility for research coin. So it's kind of selfishly thinking of like, hey, you know, how can we convince more people to hold on to it and like want to buy it? Um, That's probably going to be a small percentage of the market, though. I don't think it would. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it would be a, a pretty small thing. Um, but I think thresholds would also sort of incentivize more activity on research in general. So that could also be a selfish reason to do it. So, so you're saying like people would post more in order to get to the anonymity yeah. level? Yeah. Even longevity, like how long have you been in your, like, like sort of like seniority, how long have you been on the platform? Like you kind of like created your account two days ago. I don't feel really comfortable in giving you, you know, anonymity. Maybe, you know, just like prove that you want to be on here for some time and then do it. And anyway, I think, you know, out of all the papers that I could potentially review, there's probably like two out of a hundred where I would feel like I would be anonymous. That is probably, you know, my previous lab or any other person that I know in the field. I, I can do many more reviews where I don't, you know, I feel comfortable not being anonymous and then, you know, kind of like earn that status and do those for review that I wanted to do in the first place with anonymous uh, kind of level. Uh, Anton? Yeah, just to add in terms of user perception, if you want to incentivize uh, non-anonymous reviews over anonymous, I think it would be better uh, it would be a more feels good experience if the non-anonymous review is incentivized more. So you're not losing by going anonymous, you're gaining more by staying non-anonymous. It's just, it's the same thing mathematically, right? But it's, the perception is very different. And also speaking back, uh, picking back about Lin's comment about uh, the offers receiving, no, uh, receiving anonymous reviews, I think it could be solved by filtering right you, so you can sort by you can only look at the average that's uh, submitted by anonymous reviewers and the average submitted non-anonymously and potentially if you're an offer you can just uh, completely ignore anonymous reviews if you feel that way right yeah i mean that makes right. sense to me because, yeah, I know for sure I have no interest in completely anonymous <laughs> unmet reviews. <laughs> You've got maybe, a great point. You've got a great point. Maybe, 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 maybe it, could, it could be a choice, like, to post anonymous or not. And we can have, like, a code of conduct in what circumstances someone can post as anonymous. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. I, we should definitely have some kind of code of conduct associated with it. We can add it to our like discussion guidelines. Um, Ricardo, you have a great call too with like you need like a time box period of when you have this feature available to you. Like there's a lot of subreddits where you have to have joined the subreddit for like a week before you can add a comment. So that that would definitely disincentivize that. Oh, I'm angry at this person. 
you know, like you have to sit on it for a week or two before you have the ability to anonymously uh, send a peer review. I, I also noticed that a lot of our incentive for wanting to post anonymous seems to be to like badmouth people. Is that, I mean, hopefully it's that legitimate criticism of science, but it, it does seem like there's just like a fear of, we know we're going to say something offensive kind of a deal. I think if you look at pub peer, it, it happens. Like it's like a, a real problem. And so, yeah, I'm sure like pub peer is like the best example of like, you know, professional scientists interacting, you know, both anonymously and non anonymously. And so it definitely still happens. So I'm sure we'll see it like as well. Yeah. And in like, like we are talking about post publication, but then there is also like in pre publication, this happens a lot where like just in medicine, there's a a, medic, a medication that's already in market and has a new trial for a new condition that's that has been you know backed by pharma as a lot of money involved and three or four big departments are it and you get to review it as a physician um and and, and and you know how to review clinical trials you have done it but you are not in any of those big associations and you cannot you know directly put your name there against that pharma or against that three big departments. So it, it is a recurring theme, at least where I have, you know, reviewed it. I, I feel like out of 10, 10 reviews that I do in like a quarter or something, um, at least three, I feel like I definitely don't want my name on here. No, right. But, so, but somebody knows that you're like a vetted person who should be reading these. I'm not saying when I say putting your name on it, I don't mean that everybody has to know. I'm just saying that like, I don't see any value in a review that came from a completely unvetted source where like nobody knows who they are. Like I definitely agree that not every like there should be the option for not everybody. And if we want to have the completely anonymous option, that's fine. I'm just trying to see how that's any different from like posting a pop news article or like posting something without a source. Like how do we feel as scientists about something that could have come from anywhere? And but I there is an argument vetting process that 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 I'm fine with, you know, if you're vetting in some way or form. The play as devil's advocate, there could be an argument that we should not care about the identity, right? That that's that's a ad, ad hominem, right? We should not care about the identity of the person providing the argument if the argument is solid by itself. Yeah, I think that's like perfect world like that's how it should be end state but i think we're we're in a spot where it's like it's kind of tough to know like the validity of like an argument unless you're like deep in the field and so i i totally agree like for the for the beginning parts of this it, it would add helpful context to have like either a rep score or like certain percentage of the hub you know next to anonymous peer review if we're gonna do the rep score though, we can lay off on it until we've had enough time where people have like done a bunch of posting and everything and we get a sense of what what a rep score actually means uh, on the platform and then we can go from there. But I think right now it's like way too ambiguous. It, it's a great point. And Jeff kind of like said the same thing in the comment section that the like <laughs> reputation system is not totally accurate compared to a person's scientific expertise. So it's hard to like fully lean on it. But I think it'll become more robust, you know, over the next like six, 12, 18 months. And we'll be able to like automate. Hub jobs. specific rep would be, is definitely going to be really, really helpful. Yeah, I very much agree. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're about half an hour in right now. So I guess like on the topic of anonymity uh, within peer review, does anybody else have any like final thoughts? Um, on kind of like how we should approach this. Going good. Nice. Uh, it's funny because uh, in you uh, use article that we're going to discuss today for uh, the journal club, which we're moving to next Monday and you is going to actually join. So we'll do a full hour and like present the paper and have a discussion about it. Um, you specifically says that uh, all of the users should be non anonymous. So it'll be interesting to see. He's uh, from the George Church Lab, um, which is like pretty pretty solid laboratory. So I think there's like a, a couple different perspectives here. So I'm sure um, you know they'll be back and forth over the next like year or so. Um, cool.
Yeah, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about is um, we're building a revenue generating feature for Research Hub. And um, we're trying to think of like the best feature to build. We have a little bit of like uh, different opinions within the team. And so what we're thinking about doing is essentially having a call later this week or next week to list out all of our options for a potential revenue generating feature. And we're gonna talk about it as a team and then um, essentially pick the top three and get the community to vote on whichever one they want the most and then make a final decision from there. So what I thought would be helpful um, for our discussion as like an internal team would be to run all of these different revenue generating features past the people in the community call and then just kind of like openly talk about them for 10, 15 minutes uh, to give me a little bit more like context during our internal team discussion. So that way I can say like, oh yeah, we talked about this, people like this feature, or um, we talked about like freemium features and people hated it or something like that. So if it's cool with you all, I'd love to go over the options. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so this is just a list of all of the things that we're gonna potentially do. Um, and I can like quickly go over each category. Uh, the first is freemium features. So this could be like, hey, uh, you can be anonymous uh, if you stake XRSC, or maybe like if you uh, pay a subscription, you're able to see like what other users um, like viewed your posts or upvoted your post, kind of like LinkedIn Premium. Um, so this is like the standard SaaS model of like you can use Research Hub for free, but then if you want like more robust features, uh, you have to pay money for it or stake RSC. Um, the next one is funding. We've talked about this a bunch. Um, this is basically trying to help connect uh, like researchers who need money with uh, institutions and individuals who have money. And then the big kicker here is in theory, we'd like to help provide uh, patrons of science with some type of like ROI generating uh, asset when they fund science. So whether that's like an NFT or a creator coin or something, we wanna help the people rather than just donating money to science, it's kind of more of an investment where they can actually see like a, a return on their investment for giving money to science. Um, bounties, we talked about this a bunch. This is like a peer review bounties, um, kind of an example that Truth in the forum had uh, that um, I think it was Mohit um, responded to. You could do something like, hey, please summarize this paper for me. And here's the thousand RSC. Um, please like put together a list of references for this um, specific topic like Jeff did a couple months ago. So this is something we've talked a lot about. Um, NFTs, everybody's familiar here, help um, like authors mint NFTs and, and uh, earn money from it. This kind of goes hand in hand with the funding. I think they'll end up kind of merging eventually, most likely. Um, a paid ELN. So this is closer towards trying to compete with companies like Benchling, where we put a lot of effort into the ELN and make it uh, like very robust for a specific field of science and then uh, ask people to pay for it. So kind of like the old GitHub model, where if it's open, it's free, but if it's closed, you pay. Uh, article processing charge. This is uh, like uh, pre-publication peer review. Authors pay money, uh, they get peer review, editing services, and some online marketing. And we think we could essentially uh, help to outcompete like other article processing charges. We could do it cheaper and then authors in theory could uh, make a return on their like APC investment by getting a bunch of upvotes on their papers. Recruiting is something that's pretty interesting. So this would be um, kind of like AngelList. If you all ever use this tool, it's like an entrepreneurship um, website where people can find like uh, other people to start companies with. And so the idea here is that like we would um, find biotechs and academic labs who wanted to hire uh, scientists. And then we'd use Research Hub profiles as like a way to help connect people um, with hiring managers. So you could use Research Hub to kind of demonstrate like your um, like potential in a certain field. And then based on the content you create, it would help connect you with like potential employers uh, in like your specific subfield. And then FTO analyses. This was a suggestion we just like uh, heard from an advisor. Um, this is freedom to operate analyses. Essentially, if you have a new product and you want to like patent it, um, you have to check current patents to see if somebody else has already like thought of your idea. And so the idea here is that like if you're a biotech and you want to do a new patent, rather than paying a bunch of money to lawyers, you could pay money to Research Hub, and like our community would help to do that like initial analysis for you. So yeah. 
there's a lot of options. Sorry for kind of the rant there, but um, yeah, I guess to get started, um, does anybody here have a feature that they like particularly love or particularly hate? I like the idea of using it um, to connect like people with expertise to people um, looking for expertise. I think that could be kind of interesting if people like if there are people who would actually be interested in like paying research help to help find employees. Um, that could be interesting. The one that I'm definitely most wary of is the premium features one because with our user base as low it is as it is already, that seems like a big jump. And B, like I like how when I sh share the idea of research hub to people like right now, I'm in no way like asking them for money. You know what I mean? Like there's no like here's research hub like you can either just like enjoy science or maybe make a little bit of coin. I'm just a little bit worried that once a premium option is like, I don't know, it definitely changes the taste a little bit. Um, I don't know if other people agree with that. Yeah, just to hop in yeah. here, like one thing that's really important to keep in mind is like corporations over time become or become kind of like nameless and faceless and they try to optimize over generating revenue. So I always think about like, hey, Facebook, right? Like their main revenue is through, or revenue is through ads. So their goal is to try and like use the data they generate to make the most money through ads. So like always thinking of like which revenue generating feature we pick here, knowing like, hey, is if Research Hub is trying to make a lot of money through this, is it good for science, right? So like funding, for instance, I think makes sense for us because then it's like Research Hub is incentivized to get more people to want to fund science, which the end result is more money available for researchers. So it's like a good, you know, aligned incentive. Um, and yeah, I, I agree, Lynn, like freemium, I don't love the incentives that that gives our company, you know, is like, we want more people to sign up for like research hub, you know, expert, you know, version, it, it feels not quite as impactful as other revenue models could be. So are, yeah, agreed. Are we, are we focusing on like generating revenue a little prematurely? I don't know. I mean, it's just a thought, but it, it seems like you know, what do we have like a hundred users or something? It seems to me that we should be focusing on getting more people on the platform and getting their feedback and then figuring out revenue models based on that. Because any kind of revenue model we have right now with the user base we have certainly won't, um, I don't think, put a lot of deflationary pressure on our currency. Um, I mean, maybe funding, you know, that, that's probably like the easiest one, especially the connections that we have in the community, uh, presumably. Um, but if we're talking about, you know, putting bounties on things and things like that, how exactly to do that without having more people participate in the ecosystem, I think, yeah, I don't know, that's just a thought, but it seems to me we should be more focused on just like getting people on the platform right now instead of uh, money. So I think this is a great thought, Edwin. I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, I, I think it's like revenue changes the organizational incentives. And so, yeah, if we're if we're doing something like freemium features um, or bounties, now all of a sudden in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, where can I find more people who want to share these bounties or want to come buy these freemium features? Right. And so for funding, I think it makes a lot of sense. Because then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, hey, I need to go get more funders to put money into Research Hub. And then I think that users will come from that. Where if there's like, you know, a million dollars that's going to be given out through Research Hub over the next three months to the top scientists on Research Hub, that's an easy like advertisement for us to put out. I think that people would show up for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and when people have a really good idea on your platform, but your economics don't make sense, you get a lot of people thinking about how do we make these economics make sense? Right. So that's one thing to consider. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I think bounties could also work because, like, uh, yeah, there's just some, it's already happened organically a couple of times. And I think there's actually a lot of value there for grad students. If you could like outsource, you know, some of your like uh, kind of manual labor research time to somebody who's more of an expert in the subfield and can do it yeah. faster. I think there's, there's like potential there to help grow high quality users just from trying to generate revenue. Yeah, but I suspect that bounties also, especially with like our size right now, um, they're only going to, 
it's going to take a while before people are actually taking cash and putting it in for the bounty system. But that's what I think. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair point. That's it's probably unlikely somebody would want to like go to Uniswap and grab some RSC in order to like set a bounty. So it's a great point. Um, Anton? Yeah, I mean, I, I follow the same logic here. There is only one of those behaviors already organically happens on the platform that being bounties, right? And if we were to decide that this is the priority feature, I'm guessing there will be a lot of uh, support features built around it, right? So a UI and everything to make uh, it fancier. And I think that's the most scalable one, right? Because it uh, can start small with kind of, oh, I have a question. Can someone please post a comment that answers this question? That could be just the beginning, right? We could move on to, can someone write a review for me, right? Or can someone post a review to this particular article? Or can someone write a post about the topic, right? So, 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 so this feature, I think, is the most versatile and has the most potential. And uh, if you were to invest your engineering efforts into something, I would pick that one. Yeah, thank you. That's great insight. Uh, Joanna? Maybe we can have a, a premium with research coin or some crypto at a certain point. I mean, there are some people who are interested in promoting their coins. And yeah, they could. I mean, we can, we can exchange research coin for other coins for other type of crypto. I mean, I think, I mean, I think we like what, like Jeff, what Jeff, have you heard of Olympus? Have you heard of Olympus? Olympus? They're, they're like a play in the crypto space that you set up liquidity pools with them once you've had a certain amount of transactions in your currency. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in terms of, you know, setting up like liquidity pairs with other currencies, um, I don't know that we're quite there yet, but once we get to that, I think from like the conversation that we've had with that I've had with Jeff, once we get to the point where we've had enough of those transactions, then we'll have a pair with Olympus and we can sort of go from there. I that looks you want to kind of what this reminds me of is something we tried um, like oh, maybe like a year and a half ago where the supporting feature was tied to exposure of a post. So like if you wanted your post to be at the top of a specific hub, you could support your own post. And it would end up like increasing the number of upvotes for visibility's perspective. And so like we would collect, you know, portion of revenue on people who supported their own posts. Um, this is kind of like advertising me though. And like it doesn't end up really being great. Like kind of what happened was uh people would upvote or support their own posts in order to get more upvotes. And we had like some pretty spammy posts that were at the top because of it. And there's like bad behaviors that could come out of it. So yeah, um, Jeff. Um, I kind of wanted to double down a little bit on the bounty one, and uh, it's actually my personally my favorite one because I, I used it on the platform um, too. I think if we have a nice UI to it, like you can easily filter to see like what bounties are open right now, and like if there's a bunch of neuroscience bounties open, then sweet, I'll, I'll go through and see where I can help somebody out. And like what came come to mind to me was like when I was preparing for my qualifying exam. Um, and I had to like fish through so much like literature and like do this like really like hard work to find out one piece of information where I could have just set up bounties and like had someone direct me to where all the answers were and like where I can get the answers and it would have saved me just an immense amount of time as a graduate student and I'm sure undergrad students probably have like a similar kind of thing where they'd be happy to like get some information or clarity on an exam that they're about to take. Um, I, I really think the bounty feature is like pretty awesome. Even like putting together a review paper, you know, you can, you can ask the community, what are some of the like most hi highly impactful like papers that you want to reference? Like, I just think like it spans like from undergrad to grad to postdocs to even PIs. Yeah, so, so I agree. And I think just like from our like own internal conversations so far. I think bounties are probably the favorite. We're just trying to like explore potentially all of the options. I guess like to dig into this idea a little bit more, Jeff, like it's interesting that you say like, in theory, you would want to explore bounties if there were like, you know, bounties in the neuroscience hub. How, how do we market that? Like, how do we find the random 
you know, like physiology PhD and like get get to them and say, hey, come to Research Hub because there are bounties here for you um, that you can complete. That's that's the one piece of it which doesn't totally click in my mind is how do we how do we make people who are unaware of like what what bounties even are in theory like come to research hub and be like oh i could earn money here like so do we have a sense of the kind of media that phd students consume because as you know i was talking to you uh you pat about potentially like working with and not just like getting them to feature us but actually having them be partners you know, science youtubers um but i'm not sure the extent to which that kind of content is consumed by uh you know phd students um so yeah, do you guys, as PhD students, do you have a sense of like common types of media uh, that you, you and your peers consume? I don't contain, I don't do any sort of like pop media, if I'm being honest. I just stick with like traditional scientific media, I think. Mm. Just work. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, I, I know Grad Cafe, it was like super popular when I was making like applications for universities, but I don't know if it extends, you know, be beyond that. Grad Cafe was like super popular, but again, it was just for like application to university. So I was like, you know, kind of like checking with other people, what, like, what do they put in their application and so on. But maybe there are some, you know, other venues where they discuss other topics. Uh, but if you ask me, like, let's go where PhD, where PhD meets to, to, you know, to, to discuss science, I don't really know where it is because, like, I never really discuss science apart from, you know, research job and, you know, within the lab with my, with my co-workers. There, there are, like, um, like, career advice people for PhD students who, like, need help, like, finding a postdoc or, like, getting it in, into industry. So I think we could probably partner with those types of people where maybe, like, a referral fee or something, like, if they you know, point people to research hub to earn cash, you know, for doing science, then they get something in return. So Wait, I'm so, so you're saying that people at a uh, career center uh, at a university would get a referral fee? Wouldn't that create like a weird the, potentially? The people I'm thinking of are like independent. Oftentimes they're like consultants that hold like, like basically weekend talks on like, hey, here's how you fix your resume. You know, if you're applying to biotech sure. or something like that. Um, uh, Molly? Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to uh, like kind of it can tag along with the bounty feature. And when you ask that, where can you find that random physiology person? I think on your list, there was this article processing charge thing for pre-publication. I feel like that would be a good feature we can add now that, that, you know, like when I try to tell people about Research Hub and invite them that, hey, can you come on this? And it's about already published articles where they feel like it's kind of an added task on their list versus if we provide this service and attach it to bounties where people on the hub can get the bounties or some external person for article that's not published, that the, the work they actually want to do where they have to publish this as part of their job and research of kind of helps push that along. Um, I would feel it would solve two problems. One, the, it would move the bounties along, but also bring more crowd to do the work uh, that we want them done. So I very much agree here, because like it's weird to send a cold email to a grad student and say, hey, earn this bounty. But it's not weird to say, hey, do a peer review. Like that's that's a that seems like a big funnel where we could cold email people. And like pe most people, I think, are like, you know, neutral to happy to receive that email. So it seems promising. Um, yeah. Um, so can I say something? Yeah. Pat? yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, I, I don't know, but um, some of the people who are going to be doing these bounties also may not be grad students, and like we might want that, right? Totally. Um, so I I think um, I've had this idea where like some of the more popular science YouTubers, um, like just getting them, you know, maybe to be an editor. You know, that, that's some sort of thing reaching out to them so that they're like more just like integrating the ecosystem. I don't know what the breakdown of their audience is. I mean, it's probably a lot of people who are scientifically literate, but not PhD students, that sort of thing, who actually might be able to contribute to something like um, a bounty with a specific part of a paper. And I just, I guess I just don't know what the value of that, like how, how you guys would see the value of something like 
that having people like who may not be like our in it like our target audience but with broadly large audiences sort of just bringing them in our corner and you know not necessarily paying them or whatever but just having them be a part of our community I think it's a great idea. Um, I, I think we probably should make an effort to try and reach out to like scientific content creators and bring them on as editors. Um, even like I'm thinking about like Eleanor Shiki, and then we had a conversation with another longevity um, person who agreed to be an editor, but he's super busy, um, where they do these like YouTube reviews, which include papers. And if they like included the link to the research hub page, you know, like it's it's a lot more robust because you could have like actual conversation about the paper and how it applies to the topic in the YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Even like uh, like Andrew Huberman is like a big podcast person who yeah. does like, the citations. So yeah. yeah, some people like that would be amazing. And I haven't done any work on my end to try and reach out to them. I know, Edwin, I think you sent me a list of YouTubers. So yeah. I can I can send some cold emails out this week and try and like get a couple on a call. And then, yeah, just like offer, you know, a potential editor position or just get feedback. I wouldn't, um, I mean, you can, um, but I wouldn't send a cold email. I would like use LinkedIn and reach out to the network instead. Okay, cool. That's a good idea. I can definitely do that. Cool. I, I guess uh, we've got like seven minutes here and there's one last thing I want to talk about. So does anybody have any last thoughts on the revenue model stuff? It seems like bounties are what most people find the most exciting. And then other ones that are like worthwhile exploring are the article processing charge, um, the pre-publication peer reviews, and maybe funding. Um, I, I guess like one last thing is like the recruiting topic. Does anybody have more thoughts there? Um, I like this one a lot because there's like a nice positive feedback loop of the more employers that we bring to Research Hub, the more users will show up to Research Hub and create good content to get the attention of those employers. And that's why it appeals to me as well. And it's beneficial, like really beneficial for our users in science. Totally, it's hard to get a job. It's like the, the postdoc thing is hard. Even like <laughs> listing sites are like not great, like the um, job archive or whatever. So yeah. I think it's, we could actually like make people's lives a little bit better. I think. Um, so I'm I agree. Pretty excited about that one topic. Uh, so how do science uh, how do science students get jobs right now? Like, what's the model right now that we could be going against? So there's like industry, and then there's academia. Um, industry, I, I think, is like standard company where like Pfizer will put out like a job listing and then ask for people to apply. Um, and then correct me if I'm wrong, but I think postdocs kind of work the same way. Like it'll be like a, a professor will, you know, put a tweet out or put up a job posting and like run it through their network and try and like get people interested in their joining their lab that way. But it's still like you apply to some like applicant processing service with your resume and like answering questions and you do an interview and then stuff like that. So. I didn't think like research hub has potential. Like when I went to my PhD program, I like tried to network with professors first to like make it, you know, more likely I'd be accepted. So I like talked to the labs that like I wanted to like actually work in. And so here you could in theory, like bring someone's paper and like add a valued criticism, you know, so to show off that like, hey, I, I'm intelligent. I can contribute in your lab. Um, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of ways that this could be helpful. Also, is it completely fabricated, right? I mean, is it completely uh, broken right now, or are there any sort of aggregators of these listings as well? Or is it just uh, somebody put out a tweet and that was it? If you miss that tweet, you miss the attack. Is it like that? I mean, as far as I know, there's no like LinkedIn for like academic jobs specifically, if that's kind of what you mean. Like, academic, the plan to academic jobs is hard. And like, the other problem that's is. Mean. There's like, it's also not entirely the same because like, yeah, you can go the traditional route of like applying, but a lot of times if you just like know someone who's looking for a postdoc and they have money, they just hire you and you bypass like all of that. But, and that's something that we could even like help with. If we can help like recruiter, recruiters find that like perfect person, you know, they've read some of the reviews they've done, they've read some of their comments and they're like, Hey, you know, I'm at least really interested in interviewing this person based on what I've seen them do here on Research Hub. 
Yeah, totally. Yes. I mean, yeah. Recruiting is hard. Like to to help, you know, for PIs, like to make the process simpler, I think is actually pretty valuable. And then the topic I added a job archive is like a like scientific like job listing board. But I don't think there's this is just one of them. I don't think there's like a universal one that covers every job available. And certainly not one that, you know, where your work is just there, you know, your thoughts are just there, etc. Totally. I want to get, I want to go, okay, you know, a bit against the tide and, you know, support the, the freemium feature on just like one aspect that is, sure. uh, you know, I, I use LinkedIn, I use the, the premium as well, and I feel like it's really, really important to be able to have an opportunity to extend your network. And I don't know about academia, but if I knew a friend that knows someone else that could get me into like a super duper lab that I would really love to, you know, even have a chance to talk to the professor, you know, that would be a great opportunity instead of like just like sending an email that would probably not be replied. So I think there's an added value there. And if we're thinking about, you know, some revenue generation feature, we have to think about a potential added value that we provide as research hub and that could also be the network because you can do that on LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is more industry focused and there's nothing really for, you know, researchers and academia people. So just maybe something to, to think about. Well, the point you bring up about academic networking is like a point in and of itself that we haven't considered the research hub could, could contribute to. So I, like, does anybody have any thoughts about that? Like, Connecting people with collaborators, I think, is something that's pretty cool. Um, I think this sort of fits into the um, bounties aspect. I know, like, Safik was putting together, um, like, a meta-analysis, essentially, and we had a bunch of bounties uh, for people to do specific, you know, tasks within the paper. And so that can be a nice, like, networking mechanism. You're saying, hey, we need a statistician, you know, to help with this data analysis. And you can actually, like through a bunch of statisticians and pick the one that you want to work with and then meet them and get to know them or like i need like an expert in my field to review this paper you know to give me feedback before i finish it and then you can like yeah i think bounties are a good way to potentially like get your foot in the door when it comes to meeting new people well, what about just organically feature that linkedin has with the first and second and third connections and literal network i don't know like ricardo just brought that up and I mean, if there's nothing like that for academics, I think that deserves at least some thought, right? I, I don't know. It's an interesting in a way. Excuse in me? a way, our networking has been happening organically, don't you guys think? Like, we've at least I've already met multiple scientists that I've enjoyed, like, conversing with a couple people I've talked to about, like, possibly doing projects on Research Hub in the future once I'm done, like, graduating. Like, I know, like, I'm not saying we shouldn't figure out ideas to, like, you know, help it along. But I feel like the way Research Hub is set up, like, it is almost conducive to, like, networking because you start, like, conversations with other scientists and after, you know, maybe a couple engagements, you're like, hey, like, maybe I don't want to work with this person. Or at least you, like, get to know these people's names and if you see them at a conference, you can be like, hey, like, we've discussed a couple things, you know. I don't know. I think that it's great for networking just kind of organically. I don't know what other people think. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think like the, the feature set around like, you know, following other scientists or like being connected to them. I, I think we probably will get into that eventually. There's even like stuff we could do where like, maybe like in order to follow Edwin, I need to give Edwin five RSC or something like that. And we could, you know, make a business model out of that potentially. But um, yeah, I think I think the, the network effects are big and how we like help people connect to each other and change their like actual real lives. I think it, that's like, important um we have to go burn tokens to follow people deflationary pressure yeah that would be good I, hopefully if the like uh sec can tell us we're allowed to like have burning tokens it's such an interesting thing wallet, you know but yeah they're coming up with a new uh crypto regulation thing and apparently it was mostly written by bitcoin maxis so we're gonna have, we're gonna see a lot of uh, security regulations covering all coins like ours, which is terrible. But. Yeah, I'm sure. We've been very safe though, so we should be good. Um, yeah, I guess uh, we're one minute over now. So, uh, Safik, to finish it off. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I was just 
uh, on the point of recruiting and as ricardo said that we shouldn't completely discard premium uh, there is this company in india specifically that's intern shala that's uh, so uh, the internship market uh, was uh, completely uh, distributed like uh, like uh, sort of like you're describing the science job market right now uh, so this one company uh, sort of aggregated all the internship jobs uh, and then all like everyone seeking an internship came to them so now they've monetized on both ends of the spectrum wherein uh, if you are a paying sort of student uh, you get access to it uh, access to premium jobs like a week before everyone else does and if you are a paying uh, company uh, you get to access the uh, you get to directly access the smartest people who you would want to apply who may or may not apply if you are just a normal company uh, putting out a job listing so that is something uh, that we may uh, we may also look into uh, because premium doesn't just have to be about uh, the people applying to jobs it could also be uh, for the people like for the companies looking for people so yeah, yeah. I think also like another thing that I wanted to add it on the freemium. That's just the last one. I think freemium shouldn't be the the you know the the main kind of like revenue generation thing, but it's a great tool that you can kind of like add you know as a context, like as a something like as a side, and doesn't have to be you know that you know that that feature that really like uh, makes it or break it for you. So it could be you know it could have bounties, and then if there are some users that would have would love to have other you know. Uh, features why not allowing them to have something more than other people and you know be you know allowed to pay for having something more yeah and i think that's how linkedin does it right it's probably not the best way you can use it you know compl yeah. almost yeah. completely but then if you want to send a you know a dm to someone that is not in your connections then you have to have the premium mm -hmm. and you could just like completely disregard it or if you like it you're just gonna you know subscribe for a month and then you uh, unsubscribe so by the way, why do we not allow people to message each other on Research Hub? It's just another feature to build. I think we'll get def definitely get there eventually, like having some kind of DM okay. thing or even like a chat for a hub, I think would be cool. Um, but yeah, it's just building another feature uh, that is lower priority than some other things. Um, cool. Yeah. And, and I totally agree that like a freemium, it's a, it's a good complementary feature. You know, probably not the thing that we want to have be our main revenue stream, but could definitely be a supplementary one in the future for sure. Um, cool. Yes. Yeah, so, so I guess uh, any other closing thoughts or feedback for the team um, before we get out of here? Great. Thank you all. Um, yeah. And next week we'll uh, be doing a journal club during the community call. So I know a bunch of people have like added commentary already, but the more that we have up there, I think probably the better conver or the conversation will be. And I'll spend some time this week like marketing it. So hopefully we'll get some people from like outside the research hub community to show up too. So should be exciting. I'm excited about this one. Yeah. We're bringing in our church next. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like, he's got a lot of papers to discuss. So. He's a big one. He's a really big one. So yeah, I'm really excited to, for the, for the next journal club. Awesome. Yeah. And if anybody wants to host journal clubs on the side, let me know and we can do like bounties for it too. Because I think the, the more like social activities that we have, especially ones that generate content, um, the more fun it'll be to be part of Research Hub. So yeah, if you want to, please hit me up and we can make it happen. Um, cool. Yeah, so I guess I'll see everybody next week. Bye guys. So, bye everyone.